you, if you would please take your Bible and look to 3rd John. 3rd John, you can find that real easy. Go to Revelation and hang a left then. and You'll get there after Jude. Third John's not a book that's commonly looked at, but it has a wonderful message, and I uh, think that it would be a great place for us to look this morning. I uh, am uh, looking forward as uh, what uh, I will be preaching, and um, I am going to be preaching from um, some various passages here. Um, the next weeks, and then after Easter, um, I intend to start in a, in a series in the book of Nehemiah, and so uh, we'll get into a book series. I usually preach through books, um, but um, I kind of wanted to just kind of uh, get settled in first before I, I started doing that, and so after Easter, um, we'll be looking in the book of Nehemiah. But this morning, looking in 3 John, and uh, I think about uh, the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 20, which really is very similar to the, the subject that we see in 3 John. But Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 20, beginning with verses 20 through 28, and I'm not quoting here, but he was giving teaching to his disciples of what power is, and, and he, he talks about the world and its view of power, and the world views power as something to, to be attained, um, something to vie for, and uh, something to seek, and especially to have power over others, and we certainly see that in the world today and, and throughout history, that this is what humanity thinks of when we think of power. And that was certainly true in Jesus' day. The, the Romans were very much about expanding their power and their dominance and prestige. But the Lord, as he was teaching his disciples, teaches them that this is not the way in his kingdom. And that in his kingdom, it is the way of humility. It is the way of serving others. It is the way of submission to the Lord and submission to his word and submission to one another. And he says that just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, that his people are at their greatest when they are servants. And so this is really the message of 3 John. And I'd like us to read this. It's only 15 verses, but beginning with verse 1 here in 3 John, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified of your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does, not, who does evil 
has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. As we look at this, 3 John, I think, teaches what living according to the truth, to use the words of John here, really looks like. What it looks like for us in the world today as believers. And there are three individuals that he mentions here in this short book. He mentions Gaius, he mentions Diotrephes, and he mentions Demetrius. And for each of these, I think we see three important things that this morning I would like us to, to look at and uh, hopefully grasp from this word from the Lord. Gaius was an example of one who was living according to the truth. And it is interesting that he is in stark contrast to Diotrephes. Because Diotrephes is an example of one who was living according to the world. And then the third person, Demetrius, we, we just have one verse speaking of him. But with Demetrius, we see in him one who has a teachable spirit, who has a great reputation among the people of God. And so there are three words I would like us to think of as we think of these three that John speaks of. When we think of Gaius, what we see here is a word of adoration. And when I use the word adoration, I, I know that in our circles, we use the word adoration to talk about the Lord and how he is deserving of adoration, and certainly he is. But there's another meaning of the word adoration that uh, is not really speaking of God, but it's the idea, um, if you look in the dictionary, it's the idea of cherishing someone. And it, it would be like uh, someone saying that I cherish or I adore my wife. And it's this idea, it's not worshiping her or anything like that, but it, it's just saying that I love her deeply and, and, and I'm deeply devoted to her and cherish her. And so when we see John's words to Gaius, we see words of adoration, and we see how much he cherishes and loves his brother Gaius. In contrast to that, we see Diotrephes, and John's words to Diotrephes are words of condemnation. And then finally, we will look just for a bit at Demetrius, and John's words concerning Demetrius are words of commendation. So, simple outline for us this morning is we see a word of adoration, a word of commendation, or I'm sorry, condemnation, and then a word of commendation. And so, let's look at this word of adoration as we see how John um, writes um, to Gaius here. First thing I notice here, if you know, in verse 1, he says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And then in verse 2, he, he calls him beloved, I pray um, and for you. And then in verse 5, he calls him beloved again. And what we see here is that John expresses his love for Gaius and how he addresses him, what he has to say about him. We see that he truly does adore him. He treasures him. He cherishes him, and using the word beloved, it, it, it's interesting because if you look in um, the uh, original Greek text, he, uses, he says, my beloved, and he calls him my beloved. And so it's very personal with what he has to say to Gaius and how much he loves him. And notice here, 
that he prays for Gaius, and, and, and we see this in verse 2, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. And so we see again this love that he has for him. And what, what is it about Gaius that has him so knit to John and John so knit to him? I think we see it in this last part of verse 1, whom I love in the truth. The, the bond that John has with Gaius is the bond that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the truth. And this is what brings them together. And there is no greater bond than the bond that we have in Christ with one another. I think about this, that um, there are plenty of people who have been friends of mine over the years, and um, yet, um, when I think about my own family, um, the Lord has blessed me with uh, a lot of people in my family who are believers. And I have an uncle who just celebrated his 75th anniversary and, or, I'm sorry, birthday. And as Ann and I were leaving that, um, I turned to her and I said, he's the real thing. I've known him my entire life, and he's the real thing. And, and what I meant by that is, in Christ, he's truly a godly man, a godly man. And, and uh, there is something about that, to me, that's even a stronger bond than what we have by blood in the fact that he's my uncle. And to recognize that this is truly the family of God, and it is an eternal family. And we need to recognize that. And, and, and one of the things I, I get from this is how important it is for us to express our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those like Gaius, who is faithful, who is in the truth, who walks in the truth. And as we read here, we see that he is truly a godly man and, and he is caring for the people within the church. And I think that maybe you're not like me, and that's probably good, but I think it's easy for me sometimes to take for granted people who are consistently good and consistently faithful to the Lord because we're so used to their being good and we're so used to their faithfulness that we don't realize what a wonderful thing it is and gift it is from God to have the friendship and the bond that we have with certain people who truly are faithful to the Lord and who truly are godly people and to not take that for granted. And we need to be a people that express that to one another and, and, and not for the purpose of, of just flattery, but for the purpose of expressing heartfelt gratitude and love. I, I, I think of one of the worst things I heard as a, a kid um, one of my best friends, his parents were having marital issues, and I heard that um, he had, uh, his father had said something like this um, to someone in the church. Um, he said, well, when we got married, I said that I loved her, and that was enough. And he never told her he loved her. He never showed any expression of gratitude for her, no no words of, of cherishing her in any way, and he couldn't understand while why they were having such difficulty in their relationship. But there is this bond that we have as the people of God, and we need to be ready to express our gratitude and love 
for one another and not to take that lightly. I don't think John called everybody beloved, but he called Gaius beloved because Gaius was a true man of God who loved John, loved the church, and, and was an encouragement to everyone in the church and to John. And John loved him um, because he was that godly man. I think also it's interesting how he prays for him in verse 2. He says that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. That he cares not just for John spiritually. He cares for, or I'm sorry, John doesn't care for Gaius just spiritually. John cares for Gaius, period. I think it's very strange when we in the church sometimes try to separate how we feel about someone spiritually and how we, we dissect that and, and say that's something different than how I feel about them as a person. Uh, I think it's very hard for us to say that I don't like this person, but I love them. Now, I don't like some things people do. I'll be honest, I don't like some things I do. And so I don't, but, but I still take care of myself pretty well. And I, I know that there may be things that we don't like that people do, but it's, I find it pretty hard to love someone that I don't find things to like about them. doesn't mean I have to like everything about them. But there are things that th they have value and to take an interest in their lives and, and to care about them completely and not just to say, well, I love them spiritually, but I just don't love them. I don't like them any other way. I just think there's a problem with that, that when we truly love someone, we want the best for them. Many of you, I've got the impression, are parents, or you've been around children, you have family. My sons, over the years, they've done things that have disappointed me, and I could not be any more committed to them today than I've ever been in my whole life. And it's because I, I love them, I actually like them. Even though I realize that they have some room for growth in their lives, some major things sometimes. And it is understanding that we care about every aspect of the individual. And it is, I, I, I see this with John as he writes to Gaius. And then we see John rejoiced when he heard of Gaius' faithful ministry and, and encouraged him by pointing out the impact that he was having on others. Isn't it a wonderful thing when we can share with others and tell them, you know, I appreciate you, and this is one of the ways by what you do and what I see you do for others and the kind of impact you have on others, how you care for your family, how you are faithful to your work, what you do for the people within the body of Christ and how you're faithful to be here and faithful to care for people in the church and to give a good word and, and your encouragement just by your faithful attendance of being here. You know, the writer of Hebrews talks about this. He says that we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some do. Why? So that we might be an encouragement to one another. And there is encouragement just by showing up and being faithful to the things of God. And so it, it is this idea here that he rejoices because of Gaius's faithfulness within the church. And notice, if you go down to verse 14, John says that he looks forward to seeing Gaius. And it's just kind of like what, what we heard just a little bit ago, that coming together each week, there are several things to look forward to 
when we come together as the people of God, but one of them is to see each other, to, to, to be together as, as the people of God. And that's, that's important. And it's interesting how John says he looked forward to seeing guys. And he says, I'm not going to write these things because I'm planning to come see you. And I want to see you. And, and we see this, this desire to, to be with one another. It's difficult for me to imagine, think about this, if I tell my wife, Ann, I love you, but I don't want to spend any time with you. Now, there's a problem there, isn't there? Because when you love someone, you want to spend time with them. You want to see them. And that's not, that's, that's, kids understand that. This isn't something that's, it, it's deep but not hard to understand. And we need to recognize that and we see this. And then when he finishes here in verse 15, he pronounces this short blessing to Gaius, peace be to you. And he wants good things for Gaius. And when we think about the church and what it means to be the people of God, it means that we want good things for the people of God and that we're seeking the welfare of these brothers and sisters in Christ because we love them and we are committed to them. And it is such a tragedy today in the church where people will come and go out of different places. I remember my first church, there were seven churches probably within a two-mile radius, Southern Baptist churches, by the way. And when I got there, I soon realized what church growth was in that community. It was people moving from one church to the next church to the next church. And there's a problem when we don't have a commitment to the people of God and a commitment to ministry to them and making that commitment saying, I'm here to, to grow, but I'm also here to encourage and to serve and to build up and to be someone who is found faithful among the people of God to do the work of ministry that God has called us to do. There are far too many of us in the church today that see the church as something that we get as opposed to recognizing that the church is where God has called us to serve one another and to commit ourselves to one another. And there is great sorrow in the church. And, and, and we have, many of us in the church today, we have this consumer type of attitude at, this is what I, I want this, this is what I want for me. If missionaries had the attitude of most, uh, I, I don't know if it's most, but a great many believers today, there would be no new churches and there would be no missions because if missionaries said, I'm only going to go to a place as long as I get the things that I want, I want the right kind of music. I want the right kind of, you just name the list of all the kinds of things. I want this, I want that, I want that. There would be no mission work. There would be no new churches. There would be no movement of the people of God in areas where there's no Christian ministry if we had to go to a place where we're fed ourselves. We are fed by the word of God. And by the way, we have so many opportunities today, more than ever. You know what? People complain about, I, and I've not heard this here, but just over the years, people will complain about music. I remember being a, um, with a man, and uh, all the years I knew him in the church, he complained about the music in the church. And I got a call that he was in emergency I went into the hospital, and I was standing right next to him as he was about to die, and he said to me, Pastor, I appreciate you, and then the last thing I heard him say is this, but I still can't stand the music, and I thought, what a way to go, 
to see our Lord face to face complaining about those things. You know what I found? And I will tell you a lot of the things of the pandemic weren't good, but it, it, there were some good things that came out of it for, for me and Ann. Anyhow, one is this. I learned that I can, now I'm not great with technology. In fact, Ann had to tell me to turn my phone off here just a minute ago. It just pops on, on me now. I, I'm really getting to that age where things are going on and off. I don't know what, even what's going on around me. Um, but uh, so I, I just turned it off there. But um, but I learned that, hey, I can get old hymns that I love and put them on a playlist, and when I go for a walk, I can listen to those and enjoy those and praise the Lord with those. If I want to hear certain kind of teaching, there are places all over the web I can find good, solid teaching. As well. Now, we want that in the church. We want these things, but I'm saying here, sometimes it's not just about me and I need to go and think that when I go to church, it's the minister, and I can listen to the music I want, and I can listen to the things I want and be ministered to there, but I'm ministered to when I go in the body of Christ and am ministering to others. And that is one of the greatest ministries that we have within the church is that we're ministered to when we are ministering to one another. And that it's not about what's in it for me, but it's about others. But when we serve others, that's, the Lord's not going to let us serve others and not bless us in doing so. And so this is the kind of man that Gaius was. This is what it is, as it says that, and, and earlier on here, and he says this several times, that he walked in the truth. That um, We see this in verse 3, how you are walking in the truth. What does walking in the truth involve? Well, it's interesting. What it means is that he was a godly man, that he was mature. And, and John uses this expression here in verse 2, that your soul prospers. He, he, he is a godly man. He is a mature man in the faith. And it, it is interesting here what John also prays. He prays in verse 2 here that he, that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. I, I've often thought about this. How would we fare if God were to answer this prayer for us? If someone prayed that our physical health would be as healthy as our spiritual health is, where would be, we be physically? Would we want someone to say, I pray that everything in your life is as healthy and blessed as your spiritual walk and your maturity and devotion to Christ is? And this is what he says. Why? Because Gaius is such a man that to say that I pray that you prosper in your health and in your work and in your life as much as you do in your soul, you know, what he's saying here is this man is a godly man. And if everything else in his life prospered as he does spiritually, then he would be truly blessed in those things as well. May that be the case for each of us, that we would be that way. And living according to the truth, I think it involves who one is, but it also involves what we know. It's interesting, not in 3 John, but in 1 John and 2 John, John likes to talk a lot about the truth. And when he talks about the truth, he talks about what we know. In 3 John, the truth is about living it out. But in 1 and 2 John, it's about what is the truth. For instance, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, he says, I've not written to you because you do not know the truth. But because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? So what is the truth? The truth is that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. What is a lie? A lie is to say that he is not. And then in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, and then 11 and 12, he says, It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. 
And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So what is this truth? What is walking in the truth? It is walking in the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and salvation is is in Christ alone. There is no way unto salvation but through Jesus Christ. I think about this. One of the things I think is important for us as Southern Baptists is to make sure that we are honed in on the Word of God and what the Word of God teaches because it is the inerrant, authoritative Word of God. And it's interesting in the Baptist faith and message what it teaches about Christ, the statement that it makes according to the Scriptures. Christ is the eternal Son of God. In his incarnation as Jesus Christ, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet without sin. He honored the divine law by his personal obedience, and in his substitutionary death on the cross, he made provision for the redemption of men from sin. He was raised from the dead with a glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with them before his crucifixion. He ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God where he is the one mediator, fully God, fully man, in whose person is effected the reconciliation between God and man. He will return in power and glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemptive mission. He now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord." This is what John is talking about when he talks about Gaius walking in the truth because he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so living according to truth also not only involves who one is, what one believes, and knows, but also what one does. And look at verse 5. He says, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren. This is what he's holding up. What makes Gaius a great man in the faith is not only that he knows the truth and lives for the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he lives in the truth by how he lives for the brethren, for other brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus is our example of this, and John points this out again in 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6, By this we know that we have come to him, speaking, come to Jesus, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him, But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought also to walk in the same manner as he walked. It's one thing to say that we believe, but the person who truly believes the truth will walk in the truth, will live in the way of Christ. And Jesus taught this in John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. What is evidence of our being Jesus' disciples according to Jesus is that we love one another. That is evidence of being a part of the family of God. And then in John 15, beginning with verse 12, Jesus said these words, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. 
You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. In John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. And the one who, he goes further in John 14, and he says, the one who keeps my commandments is the one who loves me. And so to love Christ is to walk in his truth. It is by what we do. And as we look at Gaius here, notice what he says about him in verse 5. He goes on and says, You've acted faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with truth. Three observations about these, these missionaries. They were going out for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. That's why they were doing what they were doing. And they, secondly, they depended on the support of other believers. And Gaius was one of those giving that support. And I think it's important for us, as we think about that, that some of us are sent, and some of us are senders. And some of us are given that opportunity to send and support. And in this way, we're all co-workers together in doing the work that God has called us to do. Um, I tell my students all the time, quite often, maybe not all the time, but a lot, that there are people that wish they could go to school and be in class where they have teaching about theology and New Testament and the Old Testament and evangelism and preaching and teaching and missions and, and all these things that they are able to do and even the biblical languages, to learn Greek and to learn Hebrew. There are people that would love to have that opportunity, but God hasn't called them to that, and they don't have that opportunity. And so we, I tell them they should understand the privilege that they have and that people are supporting them and supporting the school, Southern Baptist, through the cooperative program so that they might get this education, not just for them, but for the sake of the church and for the mission that God has given all of us in his kingdom. So that when we go back to the church and, and these students, when they do, that they understand that what God has allowed them to learn is not for them, but it's for the people of God and for the building up of his church and the spread of his gospel. And so as, as I think about this, I was thinking about this passage here. Um, Brandon and I were talking about this just before the, the service again. I came here in 97. And uh, to be pastor here at Charlestown um, Road Southern Baptist Church and was here just about four years even, um, pretty close to that. And I think about that you made this church, and many of you were here, made an investment in not just me, but thousands over the last 20 years that you won't see until you get to heaven, and they won't see you until we all get to heaven, but the investment you made in allowing this young man to come here and pastor, but also go to school and be equipped to do the work, not only what he was doing with me here, which was essential to what God wanted me to do at that time, but also essential for point in the lives of others for all the years since as well. 
and that what you did in my life was not only an investment in me, but it was an, an investment in literally thousands. And if I'm told right by, by some of the writings, possibly over a million. And you, in taking this young guy in and allowing him to be your pastor, you had an instrumental part and still do in those things. And you may not think of those things, but I don't rarely, I, 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 I rarely forget those things. I think about you, I think about 20 years ago, you, and I think about others when I was six years old and 10 years old and 15 years old, people who poured into my life. And when I stand up before future pastors and teachers and seminary professors and missionaries and, and chaplains that are doing the work of service across this globe, I think of the people like you who have invested in my life to give me the opportunity to invest in their lives, and your investment is an investment not just in me, but in them and in the kingdom. And it's important for us to recognize that while we may not always see what God is going to do with what we do, we trust that what he does will not return void when we are faithful to his call upon our lives. And it is a wonderful work to, to recognize. And so why am I, you say, what, what are you getting at here? I think it's important for all of us that when we look at ministry, that we understand that it's about serving others and God will use that exponentially greater than we'll ever see ourselves until we get to heaven. But it is to be faithful, understanding that when we have the heart of service to others and we are looking to send others and support others, that that ministry that we're doing in that has an effect far beyond what we may see on this earth but what we will see in glory that God has used for his kingdom. And what John is saying to Gaius, you are one of those who's been doing this. You've been supporting these missionaries. You've been helping them and encouraging them in the faith and sending them out, and you are doing a great work. And it is important for us to recognize that. It is interesting, he was one who lived according to the truth, but I need to move on. I don't want to talk about diatrophies, but I have to, because John does. Because Gaius is such a great example of a godly man, and diatrophies such an example of a man who lived by the world and an ungodly man. And yet he speaks of diatrophies. Look in verse 9. He says, I wrote something to the church, but diatrophies, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say, does not accept what we say. And we here have this word of condemnation that comes. Living according to the world involves being driven by selfish ambition. And that's exactly what Diotrephes was driven by. It wasn't about serving others. It was self-serving. It was all about him and what he could get for himself. Diotrephes wanted to be the boss of the church. And there are people in the church, there are lay people, there are pastors, there are people in churches all over who would like to be the boss of the church. And it's interesting how, how John says it here, in verse 9, he says, who loves to be first among them. That is not a servant. A servant does not seek to be first. A servant seeks to put Christ first and others first and not thinking about self. And this is what Diotrephes was all about. He was about himself. And it's interesting here, his issue is not about what he believed. 
I mean, it, 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 it's interesting to note that it's, he didn't, it's not that he had an improper belief about who Jesus was or there's some doctrinal problem that, that he had. No, he, if he had those issues, John doesn't mention those. His issue is all about him. And this is what he wanted to be. And um, it, it is a shame because living according to the world is marked by an air of superiority. And that's where he was. It was all about him. And um, what, what was he doing? We see in verse 10, he, um, John says, For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does. What are his deeds? Unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. And so it's his way or the highway. And if you don't do it my way, and if it's not all about me, then you're out. And there's no room for anyone else. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul teaches, is a body with many members, and the head of that body is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are called as members of the body. Not every member can do everything, but every member is called to do something. And we are called to do it together, working together. Talking to my uncle yesterday, he has Parkinson's disease. And he said to me, he said, what's so frust frustrating he says, my mind is good, and his, he, it is. But he says, my body just won't respond in what I want it to do. And he says, I have trouble with balance. I just, he says, I, 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 I've fallen uh, a number of times, and he said, it's just, I can see it coming, and it's like I can't do anything to stop it. And... It, it, it is an amazing thing as, as we think about the, the church that there are those that it, it, it's really about my way or the highway and we forget the, the importance of the body. And I think we take it for granted until we start losing these things. And the body of Christ can be that way that if we are not careful, we take for granted the body of Christ when it is a wonderful thing, it is God's way, and it is to his glory that the people of God are members of one another, Christ as its head, doing the work that God has called the church to do and working cooperatively with that. And so we must not be diatrophies. He, he had a destructive tongue, and he was slandering John and putting people out. And there's a lot of insecurity in the church among leaders sometimes where we have to have our way or the highway and nobody else can contribute, nobody else knows anything, and we can't just work together and recognize God has gifted each of us to do the work and that we join together and together get that work done. It's when we don't work together that the work doesn't get done as it should get done. And it is, it is such a, a, a terrible thing that we see here. I, one of the things and I'm sure you know this, but one of the things I would say, and it's just been my observation over the years, a smaller church is more susceptible to a diatrophies. And there are people in, that are looking for churches. People, there are diatrophieses, if that's a word, that are looking for churches to take control of and to damage and just to put themselves forward. And 
it's important that the church, whether it's a church of 30 or 3,000, be careful of these. But I would say this, in a church of 3,000, they're easier to be dealt with than they are in a church of 30. And it's a warning that must be taken. And here's the thing. This is a weakness of mine. I don't like strife. I, and, and, so, and I don't think anyone that loves the Lord really likes strife. But what I can do if I'm not careful, I can say, well, I just want to get, go along to get along, and we should get along with each other. And that is not going to be best for the people of God. And there needs to be loving resolution to, to meet head on anyone who would tear up the work of the church and bring it down. And it is important to, to understand that. And um, I tell you this, and I speak to myself as much as I speak to you this morning as I say that, because it is so easy to just say, well, we all just want to get along and, and all that. Well, we do. But when someone is tearing down the body and tearing down the work that God is doing among his people, it is not the loving thing to let them trash the house of God. Would you let someone come into your house and just start trashing everything in your house and tearing it apart? I think you'd have something to say about that, wouldn't you? And so this is what John is doing. And it's not in a spirit of vindictiveness. It's in, in a spirit of concern for the church. And so it, it's something that we must always be, be concerned about and watchful for as, as we look at that. And again, it can be a pastor. It can be a lay person. It could be anybody. And we must be careful about that. Well, let me close with just some, some observations here to wrap this up. Living according to the truth is marked by an attitude of service. And this is greatness in the kingdom. This is what truly living by the truth is. Secondly, be intentional in expressing your love and appreciation for those who do the work of the ministry, especially those who are faithful. And I'm not talking about me here, okay? I'm talking about you, one another. And, and doing that work, to express your appreciation to one another and, and the faithful work that's being done there. Be intentional in supporting people who are doing the work of the gospel and, and, and help them and realize that your support is essential to touching lives that you may never touch, see physically yourself, but that God will use you in that. Be intentional in showing hospitality to one another, as, as he talks about Gaius doing this with these missionaries. Be intentional, again, in your service to others. And lastly, be intentional with squashing any seeds of prideful ambition and superiority because there's no place for that. Um, there's no superiority I think back to my mom. He puts his pants on one leg at a time just like I do. And there's no superiority here. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we must be careful uh, of those who would, would have prideful ambition. Well, let's, let's bow forward a prayer. Our Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for men and women today like Gaius was, who was faithful in serving your church and walked in the truth. And others like John could look to him and see that. I'm thankful for, for his work that he did. Father, we pray that you would protect this church from any kind of diatrophies and protect other churches as well, Lord. We know that Satan would use others to tear down the work that you're doing. 
And we pray for your wisdom and your help and protection in that. And Father, we thank you for Demetrius, as John mentioned him, someone who was an example, who had a good reputation, and people knew that he was a godly man, and we're thankful for him. And Father, we pray that we would be the people you called us to be to the glory of God, that we would serve in the way that through your son you have served us and continue to serve us. And that we would be that light that when people see us, that they would see Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.